Hello and welcome to another broadcast of Comics Let's Talk, Rich Buckler. The world that Rich Buckler was born into in 1949, we saw the heavyweight boxing champion Joe Lewis retire undefeated. Of course, years later he would go back into the ring and ruin his perfect record. But for now, Joe Lewis, 1949, retired undefeated. The 21st Academy Awards saw Hamlet win Best Picture. President Harry S. Truman unveiled his Fair Deal program and won an, an upset in the presidential election over Thomas Dewey, who was expected to defeat him. Also, the Edgar Allan Poe toaster arrived for the first time to toast the beloved author at his gravesite. English astronomer Fred Hoyle coins the term Big Bang during a BBC Third radio broadcast. The North Atlantic Treaty is signed in Washington, D.C., creating the NATO Defense Alliance. The Catholic Church believed they found the bones of St. Peter. The Apostle Peter, of course, is considered to be the first pope by the Catholic Church. Now, in the world of comic books in 1949, superhero comics were losing popularity once the war was over, and many titles were being canceled. This predates the rigid restrictions by the impounded by the Comics Code Authority by five years. Many soldiers read comic books to pass the time during the war, and when the war ended, a lot of those soldiers stopped reading comic books, and something had to happen to win back the fan base. Among the comp cancellations that year were Columbia Comics, which is now defunct themselves, Big Shot, number 104. Timely Comics, which of course became Marvel Comics, would cancel Two-Gun Kid at number 10, plus DC's Boy Commandos ended with number 36. On the bright side, Marvel Mystery Comics would become Marvel Tales and usher in a new era of fandom. DC would debut Superboy Comics and Timely brought us Kid Cold Outlaw. We jump ahead to 1961. Rich Buckler was 12 years old, and his biggest influence in the world of comics came out that year. Fantastic Four, number one. Timely now is officially Marvel Comics. National Periodicals publication was open on the stock market, and the initial DC, which stands for Detective Comics, like I need to tell you that, were now in the company logo. Other influences for the young buckler that year probably included Flash, number 123, which brought us the flash of two worlds. The story introduces Earth 2, and more generally, the concept of the multiverse, to DC Comics. Also from DC that year of importance to superhero enthusiasts came Action Comics number 283 and Adventure Comics number 291, The Adventures of Superman and Superboy respectively. Just six years later, Buckler would break into the medium of comics with the four-page historical story Freedom Fighters, Washington Attacks Trenton, which appeared in the King Features comic book Flash Gordon number 10, that of course November 1967. It was Jack the King Kirby himself who suggested to the young buckler that he relocate from his home in Detroit, Michigan to New York City in the late 60s. And from Wikipedia, at DC Comics, Buckler would draw the Rose and the Thorn backup stories in Superman's Girlfriend Lois Lane, number 117 to 121. That's December 71 through April of 1972. Buckler drew the first three issues of writer Don McGregor's Black Panther series in Jungle Action, Volume 2, numbers 6 through 8. We're talking September 1973 through January 1974. A run that Comics Bulletin in 2010 ranked third on its list of the top 10 1970s marvels. Rich Buckler finally fulfilled a decade-long dream in 1974 when assigned to draw Marvel's flagship series, the Fantastic Four, on which he stayed for two years. During this period, Buckler created the cyborg anti-hero Deathlock, who starred in an ongoing feature debuting in Astonishing Tales number 25 in August of 1974. Buckler would live to see his creation come to life on the silver screen through the Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. television series. It was also Witch Buckler who hired the young George Perez as his studio assistant. In 1975, Buckler worked on Atlas Comics' The Demon Hunter with David Anthony Kraft. The book and the company folded after a few issues, but Buckler revived the character with Devil Slayer for Marvel and Bloodwing for his own Galaxia magazine. Buckler collaborated 
with writer Jerry Conway on a Superman vs. Shazam story published in all-new Collector's Edition in April of 1978. He drew the newspaper comic strip The Incredible Hulk for approximately six months in 1979. A Justice League story by Conway and Buckler, originally intended for all-new Collector's Edition, saw print in Justice League of America number 210 through 212, January through March 1983. Buckler and Roy Thomas then created the World War II superhero team, the All-Star Squadron, in a special insert in Justice League of America number 193, August of 1981, which led to the team's own title the following month. In 1983, the Comics Journal accused Buckler of plagiarism, saying that he had a reputation as a swipe artist who copied poses and layouts from previous artists' work. Buckler would sue the magazine for libel, but then later dropped the lawsuit. Buckler worked for Archie Comics in 1983 and 1984. When that publisher briefly revived its Red Circle comic superhero line, he recruited Cary Burkett to write the Mighty Crusaders title. In 1985, Buckler returned to Marvel and briefly drew the spectacular Spider-Man with writer Peter David, where they produced the storyline for The Death of Gene DeWolf. He also served as editor for a short-lived line of comics by Solson Publications, where, in 1987, he created Reagan's Raiders. He was the author of two books on how to draw comic books. In 2015, he became an Inkwell Awards ambassador. Buckler drew hundreds of comic book covers and therefore drew just about every major character for both Marvel and DC Comics. And tragically, after a long, drawn-out battle with cancer, Rich Buckler would die May 19th, 2017. Another comic book icon that has passed on in 2017. Len Wein was one of my favorite comic book authors of all time, and we're going to talk about his legacy. Len Wein was born June 12th, 1948, in New York City. He graduated high school in 1966. He had an art degree from Farmingdale College. He was a very sickly kid. His father bought him a ton of comic books, and he was hooked from that moment on. At first, he wanted to be an artist, not a writer. DC Comics had a weekly tour of their offices in New York City, and his friend Marv Wolfman would take those tours at least once a month. Eventually, they got to talking to the editors, and DC editor Joe Orlando hired Wayne and his friend Marv Wolfman to write some stories. His first published story was in Teen Titans number 18, December 1968. He created the character of Red Star, which was the first Russian superhero from DC Comics. He created that character with Marv Wolfman. And Len Wein would go on to write an anthology series for DC's House of Secrets, Marvel's Tower of Shadows, and Chamber of Darkness. He also wrote for DC's romance title called Secret Hearts, and for the comic book toy tie-in Hot Wheels. And he would write for Skywald. Nightmare and Psycho magazines. At Gold Key, he would write for Boris Karloff's Tales of Mystery. An instrument of murder is hardly a proper toy for an eight-year-old, as sure as my name is Boris Karloff. And this instrument casts an evil shadow even beyond the death it has caused. And upon it is the mark of the hand. That's the name of our story, based on a novel by the celebrated Charlotte Armstrong. Also, the TV tie-ins for Star Trek and Twilight Zone, and the uh, Hot Wheels kind of knockoff called Mod Wheels. Now, when I was a kid, I read the Star Trek comics quite religiously. I loved the TV show, and Gold Key picked up the series in 1967 while the TV series was still on the air. Len Wein is credited with writing issues 9 through 14, I didn't know who Len Wein was at the time because Old Key never published their credits on their title pages. They would leave it blank. They never published what an issue number on the cover was, nor did they publish credits of who wrote and drew the issues. But I noticed that some of the issues were better written than others. So as I got older, I researched who, who wrote and drew what. Len Wein is credited with writing the issues 9 through 14. My favorite Star Trek comic is uncredited, but probably was written by Len Wein. It was number 31. It's Kirk versus Kirk. The Kirk from the previous galaxy was put in some kind of canister, and our, our current Kirk picked up that canister, the Enterprise picked up the canister, and out popped other James T. Kirk. 
and they fought. They had a fencing match. It was a great comic book. Um, kind of silly. Gold Keys, Star Treks were silly, but some were really well written. Some were really far-fetched. But that was my favorite, and I'm pretty sure that was a Len Wein comic book. But it does not list the credits as such. So I don't know if it was or wasn't. But anyway, his first Marvel comic book was Daredevil number 71 from December 1970. He also worked on DC's Adventure Comics, which featured Supergirl and Zatanna. He also worked on The Flash, Superman, and Phantom Stranger. Then, perhaps one of his greatest creations, Swamp Thing. Hi, I'm Len Wein, creator of Wolverine, Swamp Thing, the new X-Men, Human Target, and God knows so many other characters, and this is your weekly shout-out. The art of creating villains is fascinating. First and foremost, with the rarest exception, no villain believes they were a villain. They always think they're the hero of their own story. But the villain needs to be the yang to the hero's yin, or vice versa. You've got to have a villain who embodies the opposite elements, or as many of the opposite elements of the hero as possible, to give you something for conflict. Uh, Arcane was exactly the antithesis of Swamp Thing. Swamp Thing is big, huge, physical. Arcane, when you first meet him, is small, frail, and mental in so many different ways. And the character evolves from that. One character has what the other character wants. In the case of Arcane, he wants the physicality that he no longer has. He can barely get around. He's been trying from the time you meet him to build himself a new body. He's created these creatures that I call the Unmen, who are all his failed experiments. And Swamp Thing, who looked to be made of the earth and thus immortal, was what he wanted. I mean, the title of the story was The Man Who Wanted Forever. He created that character with Bernie Wrightson, tragically another icon, comic book artist that passed away this year. The first appearance of Swamp Thing was House of Secrets, number 92, in 1971. And that went on to develop its own series, which lasted until 1976. Two movies and a syndicated television series were based upon the Swamp Thing uh, comic book. Also, a five-episode animated series came out. They also did the saga of the Swamp Thing with Alan Moore in the 1980s. And he also wrote for Marvel's Man-Thing, which was Marvel's version of a similar character, a swamp monster that was uh, kind of created. It's hard to tell who created what first because it came out like within a couple months of each other. And that comic book introduced Barbara or Bobby Morse. Also the concept, whoever knows fear burns at the Man-Thing's touch. He later edited Steve Gerber's run on that title. There was a Man-Thing movie made also, but it bore very little resemblance to the Marvel comic book's character. He had a brief run on the Justice League, issues number 100 to 114 with Dick Dillon, and he reintroduced the Seven Soldiers of Victory in that title, also the Freedom Fighters. Another creation was the Human Target, which also saw two television series, a short-lived show on ABC with Rick Springfield, plus the Mark Valley series in 2010 on Fox, which lasted a couple of seasons. For Detective Comics, he wrote a Batman story where Batman was blamed for the murder of Talia al Ghul. For Marvel, he worked on Marvel Team-Up, Amazing Spider-Man, Incredible Hulk, The Fantastic Four, The Defenders, and Brother Voodoo. The Hulk story between Hammer and Anvil is on the list of a thousand comics you must read before you die. A lot of people think that Chris Claremont was the creator of the new X-Men with Dave Cockrum, but that's not the case. Here's uh, Chris now to set the record straight. How did you get the idea to give a new start to the X-Men? Actually, I didn't. Len Wein and Dave Cockrum did, with, working with Roy Thomas and Stan Lee. They did the first issue, which is Giant Size X-Men number one, and then Len had to leave the book, and he said, did Eddie wanted to know who was going to write, wanted to write it. I didn't even give him a chance to ask a question. I just kicked down his door, jumped on him, and said, I'm doing it. Because I'd helped him with a couple of little moments along the way in the first, in Giant Size, and I wanted to work with Dave Cockrum really badly. That's right. Len Wein and Dave Cochran created the modern X-Men. Now, Chris Claremont, of course, went on to really develop the characters and flesh them out, but Wayne was the original writer on that. Len would have a fallout with Marvel Comics and then return to DC in the 1980s, late 70s and early 80s. In Batman number 307, 
Len Wein created Lucius Fox, a character played by Morgan Freeman in the Dark Knight trilogy. He also created Clayface in Detective Comics number 478. He worked on the Untold Legends of Batman, plus the Batman and Incredible Hulk crossover comic book, which was a giant-sized treasury edition. He worked on Camelot 3000, the new Teen Titans, All-Star Squadron, and Batman and the Outsiders. He was editor of Alan Moore and Dave Gibbons Watchmen, which was based on uh, Carlton Comics. It's a shame that they didn't use the Carlton comic book characters. Moore had to recreate characters that were inspired by Carlton Comics because they wouldn't let him use the Carlton Comics characters in this story as they had plans for those characters in the DC Universe. But I say it's a different universe anyway. You've got Richard Nixon still as president in the 1980s, and I think they, they should have let him use the Carlton Comics characters. That would have been a great homage to Co Carlton Comics superheroes. He also worked on Legends, the Blue Beetle Revival, the DC Challenge, and Wonder Woman with George Perez. And he would create Gunfire with Steve Irwin. After he left DC again, he moved to the West Coast and became editor-in-chief at Disney for three years in the early 90s. And after leaving Disney, he wrote and edited animation shows like X-Men, Batman, Spider-Man, Street Fighter, and many, many. And for Dark Horse, he worked on the Conan Book of Thoth with Kurt Busiek and Kelly Jones. He worked for Penny Farthing Publications on Victorian. Also, Bongo Comics, Simpsons, and Futurama. He also worked on the Watchmen video game, The End is Nigh. He returned to DC and worked on their retroactive titles, Batman in the 70s and Green Lantern in the 80s. He also wrote, or co-wrote, Batman 66, The Two-Face Story, which is being turned into an animated movie. Adam West's last performance as Batman will be Batman 66, Batman meets Two-Face. Ween's health started to slow down and he had to undergo triple bypass surgery in 2015. Sadly, he passed away recently on September 10th, 2017. Lynn Wayne's awards included three Shazam awards for his work on Swamp Thing, including Dark Genesis, which was Swamp Thing number one in 1972. He won the Comic Fan Art Award in 1974 for Best Writer. He also won the Ink Spot Award in 1977, also the Comic Buyers Award in 1982 for Best Editor. And he was inducted in the Will Eisner Comic Book Hall of Fame in 2008. It's a brief look at what Len Wein contributed to the world of comic books, both Marvel and DC. He created Swamp Thing. He created Wolverine. When I first created Wolverine, I created him as a Canadian mutant, specifically so that whomever ended up with the assignment of writing the new X-Men book, should it ever occur, would have a Canadian mutant handy if he wanted him. I think from our perspective, what makes Wolverine so attractive is the unpredictability. The, the belief that, that he doesn't give a damn about anybody but himself and spends his whole life proving that's not true. In the first film, there's that great moment where he first meets Rogue and he's uh, going to dump her by the side of the road because she's not what he wants at that moment. He's going to search for something else. And, and, and she goes, well, if you leave me here, where do I go? What do I do? And he says, I don't know. She says, you don't know or, or don't care? He says, pick one. <laughs> and I think that kind of describes the character. And yet he spends the rest of the film protecting her and spending the whole thing trying to save her life, even though he's just said to her, I don't care what happens to you. It's not true. At the heart of him, he cares what happens to everybody around him. He created the new X-Men which is one of the most important titles in Marvel's history. And that's all the time we have for this program. Come on and join me next week. We'll have another broadcast of comics. Let's talk. Until next week, this is Kevin Given saying so long and keep reading those comics.